Farmer said, I was riding my horse down the street when a truck came barreling around the corner and the attorney stopped him and said, Sir, I just want a yes or a no. Is it true that you told the police at the scene of the accident that you were just fine? The farmer said, I was riding my horse down the street when a truck came barreling around the corner. The attorney cut him off again and said, Judge, Judge, would you just make this man answer my question, yes or no? And the judge says, well, it seems like he's got something he needs to say, so why don't you listen to him? And so the farmer said, I was riding my horse down the street when the truck came barreling around the turn and ran into us and broke my leg and the horse's leg in the accident. The police came to the accident and they asked me how my horse was and I told them he had a broken leg and he pulled a gun out and shot him. Then he turned to me and he said, how are you? And I said to him, I'm just fine. See, context is everything. And when you're reading the Bible, context is everything. And I don't know that there's a better example of that than Psalm 132. So I imagine many of you have read Psalm 132 in the past. If you don't know the context of Psalm 132, you're not going to get a lot out of that psalm. The context is really quite an amazing story, and you, but it doesn't give you the context. It doesn't tell you up front, unless you've got a study Bible and some commentaries that you can go to, you're going to just read the surface out of context you're not going to get the full message. So today we're going to take a look at Psalm 132. And uh, before we start, I'm going to give you some of the context. This was a song of celebration, and it was actually written by Solomon. I know most of the psalms are written by his father, David, and some psalms are written by other psalmists. It's pretty rare to find a psalm written by Solomon. This is one of them. And he wrote this to celebrate the dedication of the temple. Now, you might remember that David, his father, wanted to build a temple for God, but God said to him, you're a warrior, you have blood on your hands, and you can't build my temple, but your son will be allowed to build my temple. So David, who desperately wanted to build the temple, he made all the arrangements, he chose the place, he gathered the material, so that when Solomon became king, he was ready to go and he could build this magnificent temple to the Lord. And on the day he dedicated that temple, he, had, he wrote this psalm, which would have been his greatest message of praise to God that he ever wrote because it was for the greatest day of his life, the day he dedicated his crowning achievement of his entire life, which was the building of the temple. So this is an amazing psalm that he wrote for this moment. And in the first seven verses, uh, he remembers his father's passion. Lord, remember David in all his self-denial. He swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. We heard it in Ephratah. We came upon it in the fields of Jair. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May, you, may your priest be clothed with your righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. Now we have to give you some more context right now because a lot of that doesn't make any sense. Does it make any sense when he said to you, We heard it in Ephratah, we came upon it in the fields of Jair. What in the world is David talking about? Well, 400 years before David was born, the Lord told Moses to build an ark. Not the kind that Noah built where you put all the animals in, but an ark that looks, in fact, if you go to the next slide, I think we have a picture of it. It looks a lot like that. It was a, uh, just a, it was a wooden chest, but it was covered inside and outside with gold. And inside the wooden chest, were, I mean this gold ark now, the Ark of the Covenant, would be placed the tablets, the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments, would be placed this rod that Aaron carried along like a walking stick that he had put in the ground and the Lord caused buds to come out of it to show God's life-giving power. 
And there was a jar in there that contained a sample of the manna that God used to keep his people alive for 40 years in the wilderness. And these were reminders of the power and the presence and the law of God. And they would be placed in that Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant was a lid that was made of solid gold. It's called the mercy seat. And on top of the mercy seat were these two angels, cherubim. And their wings would spread across the whole mercy seat. And God told Moses that it was right at that point where the angels, where the, between the wings of the cherubim, he says, there I will meet with you. So the Ark of the Covenant would represent to the people of Israel from the day of, of Moses on, it would represent the power and the presence of God. And it was, it was the most important possession that the people of Israel had. Well, when David became king, the Ark of the Covenant was nowhere to be found. It was lost. Can you imagine this? Uh, you may have seen a movie called The Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was literally a lost ark. In the movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, the premise is that during World War II that the Nazis thought that if they could get a hold of this Ark of the Covenant, that they would have the power of God fighting on their side. And they discovered at the end, when they did get a hold of it, that the power of God attacked them and destroyed them instead. In reality, something very similar had happened. When Saul was the king, they would carry this Ark of the Covenant into battle with them. In one particular battle, Saul didn't wait for Samuel to come offer sacrifices. He decided to take that upon himself, and he was never meant to offer the sacrifices. And, and God decided if he was not going to trust God in the battle, that God was going to withdraw his power from the army. And he allowed the Philistines to soundly rout the Israelites and, and defeat them in battle. And when they did, the, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. They captured it like a, a trophy from the war, and they brought it back to their capital, thinking that it would bring all kinds of blessings to them, like the Germans thought in the movie. Well, it didn't bring blessings to them. It, they were disease and, and all kinds of problems with them, so they couldn't get rid of it fast enough. They, they took it to the border of Israel, took it to the first town they got to over the border of Israel, and just deposited it in a field. Can you imagine this? The Ark of the Covenant was just put in a field. And worse than that, it stayed there for 20 years. 20 years. Nobody bothered to get it. Nobody bothered to find it. And they didn't know what to do with it. When David became king, the first thing that he did when he became king was to find the ark and to move the ark to Jerusalem. That was the capital. And the power and the presence of God had to be in the very center of the capital, which is in the very center of Israel, had to be central in the nation and the lives of all the Israelites in the same way God was in the center of David's heart. So he did. David moved the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And on the day that the Ark of the Covenant was carried up the hill into Jerusalem, David had 30,000 troops lining the streets in this massive parade. And he led the procession himself as the king. And he was so overcome with joy as the power and the presence of God was coming into Jerusalem, that it, the scripture tells us he danced with all of his might. He threw off his outer garments and he danced with all of his might as he expressed his joy in the presence of God. That's the context of the psalm. So, so look at it again where you see when it says that um, at the, in the beginning, David in his self-denial, he swore an oath that he made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed or allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my lids until I find a place for the Lord. He wanted to make sure that the Lord was in the right place. Of course, he wanted to build a house for it, but that would fall to Solomon to do that. But he wanted to put, find a place for the Lord. And so that's what he means when he says, um, we in verse Six, we heard it in Ephratah. We came upon it in the fields of Jr. That's what they came upon in the fields, the Ark of the Covenant. Let us go to this dwelling place. Uh, let us worship at his footstool, they said. And, and come, uh, Lord, come to your resting place, you and the Ark of your might. 
May your priests be clothed with righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. That's what David did. He sung for joy as the ark was brought into Jerusalem. That's the context. And when you know the context, you understand what this psalm is talking about. Let's go to verse 10. For the sake of your servant David, again, this is Solomon writing this, do not reject your anointed one. The Lord swore an oath to David, a, a sure oath, he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. Well, this is Solomon writing this. He is the son of David who sat on the throne. And the first fulfillment of that covenant that the son of David would sit on the throne was Solomon himself who's writing this. But Solomon knows that the promise went far beyond him because it says that his son and David's son and their, his son's sons, uh, and it, they would sit on the throne forever and ever. You see, the ultimate fulfillment of that promise was another descendant of David, who was Jesus Christ, who will reign forever and ever. So this is a, a messianic prophecy that David's son and his descendant would sit on the throne forever and ever. Now, how did Solomon know when he built that temple, how did he know that God would reside there? Well, he remembered the promises that Solomon, that God had made to his father. So look at verse 13. For the Lord has chosen Zion. Zion, by the way, is another word, another name for Jerusalem. The Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling, saying, this is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. You see, God is saying, I will sit enthroned in Jerusalem. He already had said the descendant of David, speaking about Jesus Christ. And now he's saying that God himself will be enthroned. It's the same thing. Jesus Christ is God himself, and he is going to be enthroned forever and ever. So the reason that Solomon knew that God would be present in that temple was that God said, I desire it. I've chosen Jerusalem as my place, my dwelling place. He desires to dwell among his people. Not only that, he promises he's going to pour out blessings. And you see it in verse 15. I will bless her, meaning Zion and Israel. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor I will satisfy with food. I will clothe her priest with salvation. And her faithful people will ever sing for joy. Here I will make a horn grow for David. I will set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but on his head will be adorned, his head will be adorned with a radiant crown. By the way, it gets a little confusing in that last verse. He talks about a horn for David and a lamp and a crown. These are three words that are associated with the Messiah. The horn is always associated with power. The lamp is associated with wisdom. The crown is associated with authority. And he's talking about the power and the wisdom and the authority of the Messiah who is going to reign forever and ever. This is like another promise that God is going to pour out blessings on the people, but the greatest blessing of all is he's going to send the Savior. He's going to send the Messiah who's going to reign in, on David's throne forever and ever. So Solomon dedicated that temple 3,000 years ago. 1,000 years before Christ was born, he built the, temp the temple. They placed the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, and he dedicated that temple, and they read this psalm 3,000 years ago. There's no temple in Jerusalem today. There's a wall left that was once part of it, the, the Wailing Wall. People go to the wall, but there's no temple in Jerusalem today. So where... Does God dwell now? Now, Solomon knew, by the way, that, and David knew that God was not limited to a building. Just like when we call the church that God's house, we go there to worship, and we believe God is present in a special way when we worship here. We know he's not limited to the building, because when you get in your car and drive home, he's with you. He's omnipresent. But there's no temple in Jerusalem, so where is God dwelling now? The answer is, he dwells in you. In Ephesians chapter 2, I think we have the scripture up on the next slide here. Ephesians chapter 2. 
Paul wrote this to the church in Ephesus. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on a foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. You see that? There's no temple in Jerusalem, but he says, he's talking, by the way, to the church here in emphasis. The whole church is a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So you as a church are being built together to become a dwelling where God lives by his spirit, a holy temple for the Lord. So where we once had a physical temple that was magnificent in all of its glory, the new temple is the church, all of God's people built together. But it's not just us collectively as a church, it's also you as an individual. Look at the next verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Now he's talking to individuals. To each one of you, he would say, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. When you receive Christ, at the moment you become a Christian, you confess your sin, you, by invitation you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. The moment you do that, the Holy Spirit indwells you. And he never leaves you, he never forsakes you, and he, you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. You, individually. How do you know that God is going to reside in you? The same way Solomon knew that God was going to reside in the temple. He looked at God's promises and he believed the promises. What are his pro what's his promise to you? He promised in Revelation 3.3, 3, we, we have this, he said that he stands at the door of your life and he knocks and if you hear his voice and you open the door, he says, I will come in and reside with you. That's a promise of God. And so all, all of you who have prayed that prayer and invited him into your life, you know beyond a doubt that he is living inside of you. That's his promise. That's how you know that he's in you. You may not feel worthy of having a holy God living in you. I certainly don't. None of us are worthy. And he doesn't live inside of you because you are worthy. He chooses to. He desires to. Just like he desired to live in Jerusalem, he desires to live in you. He desires to dwell among his people, to be near you and close to you. And the Holy Spirit dwells in you. When I worked with Youth for Christ in Denver, we had our retreats at a retreat center in Colorado Springs called Glen Erie. I believe I have a picture of it right here. This is a castle that was built in Colorado Springs. It's an amazing castle. And the story behind it is even more amazing. In 1875, uh, General William Jackson Palmer, he was uh, the man who actually founded Colorado Springs. He, he brought railroads all throughout Colorado, which opened up all kinds of coal mines and other things. He was a remarkable man. He fell in love with a British woman named Mary, although he always called her queen. Um, and he asked her to marry him and moved to live with him in the United States. And she said that she would miss the castles in England. And he said, I'll build you one. And this is what he built. I believe, if I understand the story correctly, that this was a castle that was in England and he found it and he had it taken apart, shipped over here, out to Colorado and reconstructed it for her. It's a massive, beautiful castle, right at the foot of Pike's Peak. From almost every window in this, in this, in this castle, you can look up at Pike's Peak towering over that. It's the most spectacular grounds, the most spectacular city, scene ever. And Mary lived with him for a short time, and only five years later, she had health problems that the doctor said were related to the altitude, and that she needed to go back to England for her health, and she did. She and her daughter at that time uh, moved back to England. And General William Jackson Palmer sold Glen Erie, because without her there, it was just an empty building. Unless the Lord is present in the church, 
It's just an empty building. There are many churches around our country and around the world today that are simply empty buildings because God is not present in those places. But unless you, unless the Lord is present and central in your life, and yours is just another empty life. You and I look around at people all around us that have all the material things of this earth, but if they don't have the living God living inside of them, they're just another empty life. David knew that. Christ has to be central, and he found a place for God. He wouldn't rest until he found a place for God. My prayer is that you will be restless until you find a place, a central place in your life for God. Let's pray together. Lord, we don't understand why an almighty, holy God would want to live inside of us. But you tell us that you do because you love us. Lord, we can simply say thank you and praise you for that and respond by giving all of ourselves to you. Lord, forgive us for having this privilege of having you live inside of us and, and for us to push you off to the side and make you just a, a peripheral part of our lives, not in the center. Lord, I pray that this day that the Holy Spirit will speak to many of us and remind us that you can't be just out in the outskirts of our lives, but you must be in the very center. Our whole lives must revolve around you. Lord, be central in our lives today. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and and sing our, our closing song here together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, and this is my story. Visions of God. 